I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Sheboygan County Board of Supervisors for Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. Are we certified in compliance with the open meeting law? We are. The agenda was posted on the 17th of June at 3 p.m. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Next is the roll call. Twenty five supervisors are present. All right, next is approval of the May seventeenth, twenty twenty two journal. Supervisor Brower. Thank you, Supervisor Brower. Supervisor Wagner? I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. As a reminder to all County Board Supervisors, um, please speak directly into the microphone or it, when you speak or it won't be picked up on the recording, okay? Is there any discussion regarding the journal? Seeing none, please vote. That motion is approved unanimously. And next is consideration of appointment by executive committee. To Glacierland Resource Conservation and Development Council, a reappointment, Al Bosman. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to concur with the appointments. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Brower. I will second them. Thank you, Supervisor Brower. Under discussion? Seeing no discussion, please vote. Appointments approved unanimously. Next is consideration of appointment by county administrator. Also to Glacial Land Resource Conservation and Development Council, a reappointment, Julie Sedelka of Plymouth. Is there a motion? Supervisor Clark? I move to approve the appointment. Thank you, Supervisor Clark. Supervisor Brower? I second the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Brower. Under discussion? Seeing no discussion, please vote. That appointment is also approved unanimously. Next is a presentation. We have Craig Thompson, a Department of Transportation Secretary on bipartisan infrastructure law. Mr. Chair, uh, good evening. I know uh, you have a very full agenda tonight, so I won't try to take up too much of your time. Uh, but uh, uh, the administrator had asked me if I could come give a little bit of an update on where we're at with the transportation and with the, with the federal money that's coming in. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and again, I will try to be brief. So if we look at, uh, I should say this before I start that, I, I was going to be coming to speak here tonight, and the Northeast region folks, of course, the region you're in, uh, reached out to me and asked if I was going to be speaking, and I said yes, and they asked if they could provide me uh, a couple things that, that, that uh, they would like that I said, and I said sure, and so they shared those with me, and I, I, I'm not going to go through 
all of the uh, bullet points they had, but they really wanted to, for me to impress upon you that your highway commissioner, Greg Schnell, is uh, the model that they hold up to all the other counties in the region, whether it's on routine maintenance, whether it's on the use of liquid brine, uh, whether it's just on whenever they need anything uh, for him being ready to go. So I'm not gonna tick through all the things that they have, but just rest assured that people in our region are very, very happy and they hold Sheboygan County up uh, really as, a, as an example to other counties in the area. So if you see any of our regional people, Colleen or Tom Buchholz, make sure you let them know that I did in fact tell you that, that uh, the great job Greg's doing. And we really do appreciate that because our partnership with counties is just absolutely paramount to, to doing work here in Wisconsin. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I think you probably know, but I, a lot of the other uh, secretaries across the country, I've imparted upon them, I think they all know it now, we're the only state in the country that has the model that we contract with counties to do maintenance on the state highway system. Um, and so when I talk to a lot of folks and they talk about workforce issues and, and all these different things at the state level, uh, you know, that's one area. I said, we, we don't have those. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, we, we actually, and it's historical, it goes back over 100 years, that we contract with counties to do the, to do the maintenance on our system. So, so our relationship with counties is just so very important. And so the fact that, that uh, your county is held up in this region is really an example of the others, I think, is, is really a testament to the leadership in your county. Um, so briefly, as far as in Wisconsin, where we're at with transportation, uh, I don't want to go back too far, but I, but I do want to just say that, uh, you know, prior to uh, when, when Governor Evers ran for election, he talked about fixing the roads, made it part of one of the three things um, that he had run on. And part of the reason for that was we had gone several decades uh, without uh, new investment in our transportation system other than increased borrowing, uh, really since the Thompson administration. Through the Doyle administration, we hadn't. Through the Walker administration, we hadn't. And it had been... Um, really the issue that had held up a lot of budgets. And there had been a lot of debates within, uh, within the same entities, within the same party, a lot of disagreement. And so uh, the very first budget uh, that we started, we were very happy to be able to reach agreement with the legislature uh, to pass uh, the first ongoing investment in transportation. And again, over decades, over $400 million of, of new and ongoing revenue that would go in. And where all of that money went, that entire upper went into really two spots. It went into well, the one area, general area is it went into fixing what we have. Uh, it went into either the State Highway Rehabilitation Program, which is the, the program that we use to uh, simply uh, maintain and update our two-lane state highways, and it went into local, local aids, whether general transportation aids or local road improvement programs. So that's where the entirety uh, of that increase went. And so we were very excited about that to begin rolling that out, and then, of course, uh, COVID hit, right? And you all... We're dealing with it. We all had to have workers go home uh, overnight, and we had a lot of decisions that we had to make. And uh, one of those was, and, and we hosted a lot of calls with our 10 neighboring states, you know, what, what do we do in terms of, um, of our projects moving forward? Uh, do we delay some projects? Do we, do we uh, defer some, some projects? Do we cancel some projects? And a lot of states did. And we decided that we were going to do our best working with, with the locals, with our contractors, with our engineering uh, consultants. Uh, to do our best to move forward. And that first year of COVID that we were in, we had 370 projects that we had scheduled, and we had 370 projects that were finished. And we were very proud of that. And actually, while traffic was down, we were able to actually uh, realize some significant savings because we could do some adaptive scheduling and close some more lanes and actually able to finish some, um, you know, had a schedule and under, under budget. And, and then the following budget, um, we were able to reach concurrence with the legislature again uh, to not have the same level of increase as before, but to make sure that we kept pace with, with that higher level of cost of inflation for our state level, and then actually some more uppers for locals, another $100 million in the local road improvement grant program, and some increases in general transportation aid. So over that four-year period uh, for the locals, it's been about a 30% increase uh, in funds for transportation between uh, general transportation aids and local road improvement program. And we know, I mean, I know you're all putting it to great use, so I appreciate that very much. And then on the heels of that, as we had talked about, uh, the, at the federal level, they passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so uh, while President Biden signed that into law in November of, of the previous year, the way it works at the federal level is that uh, it, it, just because he passed it does not mean it becomes law and that we get the money. Congress has to appropriate the dollars. And uh, we know how Congress works or, or doesn't sometimes. And so it took quite a while. And they didn't appropriate the funds until mid-March. It was actually part of the Ukraine uh, package. And so that, that became uh, somewhat problematic for us and all the other states in the country because uh, with the way federal funding works for transportation is when they, 
when they uh, give money for an authorization, um, which is generally, by the way, five years. So that, that bill they pass gives us five years of certainty. And it's, it's overall about a 25% increase just in our formula funds, not to mention other areas. So a significant increase. But when the federal funds go out to a state, the state has to obligate those federal funds within that federal fiscal year, or you lose them. And then in the fall, uh, the, the, the federal government goes through, and states that were unable to obligate, they, they redistribute those dollars to other states that are able to. And we've, we've been very successful over the last two years. We've, uh, between the two years, we were able to get $100 million of redistribution dollars from other states that had not been able to. But the federal fiscal year ends September 30th. And so for them to not obligate, or for them to not appropriate those dollars till March 15th, then we had to wait to get our final tables. And then state law here says that, as the secretary, I had to submit that federal plan to the Joint Committee on Finance, because it was a different amount of federal money than what was anticipated when the, when the state budget was passed. So we still had to do that. So we submitted that, that they approved it, and we are moving forward. But I, w I tried to go out to Washington, D.C. with some of my colleagues to say, we didn't get this money till later. How about we move that? That deadline out to later, and we, I was woefully unsuccessful in that in that effort. So, um, so we've got a very compressed time frame in this first year of that five year period to obligate those funds. At the state level, that's really not that huge of a hurdle because uh, we had state projects that were what we call on the shelf that were ready to go that we could assign those dollars to. But for the locals, um, much more challenging. Local governments generally don't have projects on the shelf, not going to spend, expend a lot of dollars to get a project ready if you don't know um, that it's going to go forward. They're not evergreen. I mean, you can't just leave them there. So um, we did try to use that time between November when the president signed the bill and March to April when we were able to get those out to begin. We worked very closely with the counties Association, the League of Municipalities, and the Towns Association to say we would like to get a lot of this money to you but you're going to have to have the types of projects we need ready to go, and this first year is going to be very challenging. And they worked with, with people like Adam and, and, and a lot of other leaders uh, across the state to really try to get that, that word out. Um, and then we actually solicited for projects even before we got approval on the dollars, just trying to get as ready as we could. Um, a lot of states decided in this first year just to put it on state projects because it was just, just too difficult to get it out to the locals. But with that being said, um, I know it's been, a, it's been a very heavy lift for counties, for towns, especially for smaller towns, villages, and municipalities. Because for this first year, uh, one of the things I stressed is it had to be, since we had that very, very short time frame, it had to be projects ready to go. We couldn't have somebody come with the project and say, we still need some real estate, we still need utility movement, we, we've got railroad. We would never be able to get that done. So it had to be projects for this first year uh, that were ready to go. And so. I know for our folks at the, at the local level, it's been a lot of work. I know for your folks at that level, it has been a lot of work. Uh, but uh, I am happy to say we've gotten those, we've approved. Uh, not everybody got the projects they put in for in the first round, and I will get to that in a moment. But um, I do believe we're going to be able to expend all those. The other thing I did say, though, is if, if a project would fall off or something, we will take that money then and put it on a state project so that we don't leave any money on the table uh, for when the feds go around and, and do distribution. But overall, it was uh, about a 25% increase in what we call our formula funding, our usual money that we get for, for roads and bridges. Uh, it was about a 40% increase for transit. We had about a 50% increase for airports. Um, so significant across uh, those different areas. And then in addition to the formula money we got, um, states got a separate, what they called special bridge funding. And in Wisconsin, and I guess this depends on how you want to view it, it could be either glass half full or half empty, depending on how you... We actually were on the lowest rung of the amount that we got because it was based about the number of deficient bridges that you have in your state. So in some ways, a good thing. In other ways, you know, we, we could have gotten more. But we got significant money outside of that formula. It's $225 million for the next five years, or about $45 million a year, uh, up to the state's discretion on where to use that. And so um, I sat down with our folks, and we looked at Wisconsin. And of the bridges in Wisconsin, about the the locals have about 9,000 bridges. Uh, there's about 6,000 bridges on the state system. Of the 6,000 bridges we have in the state system, about 2% of ours were rated in poor condition. Of the 9,000 at the local level, about 10% were. So we made the decision, and the legislature c concurred when we uh, sent to the Joint Committee on Finance, to take 100% of that bridge money and give it out to the locals. So the good news about that bridge money is it does not have that same type, type frame 
that that other road and, and other projects money have. We've got a four-year rolling average on each one of those years to get that bridge money out. So uh, if Greg has bridge projects around here, uh, you, you're going to have a very good chance of getting them funded uh, to be moving forward. And that's at, a, that's at an 80-20 split. But I, I guess as, as far as that federal money goes, I just really want to say that um, it's been kind of hair on fire for everybody. Um, but it really, I think it was because we tried to get as much out to the locals as we could under this. Um, and I know it's been a lot of work and, and some folks put in and didn't get anything in that first round and may have felt frustrated. But that is the first year of five years. And I think if you've put the work in and you've got projects ready, you should feel uh, pretty confident, uh, whether it's yourself at the county level or I know you work very closely with your underlying municipalities uh, within Sheboygan County, uh, that I think over the course of those five years, most of those projects that people are are able to get through the process uh, uh, will get funded. So um, we feel pretty good about you know the, what we were able to do at the state level, which actually put us in a position to, when we received these federal dollars, when I talked about having projects in the shelf at the state level, we could put them on. I'm not sure we would have been in that position if not for uh, the, the two budgets that we had at the state level before that. So um, we think uh, with this federal money coming in, um, we're gonna be able to do a lot of good. Uh, the other thing outside of the, the, the road money, the bridge money, uh, the transit money, and the airport funding, uh, there was also funding for electric vehicle charging stations. And so for Wisconsin, we're going to be getting uh, about $78 million over the next five years. We haven't expended any of that yet. We need to submit a plan to the federal government uh, in August about how we're going to, how we propose to deploy those funds. And we have to demonstrate to them that along what we call our um, our alternative fuel corridors, which are generally our interstates, and then we're proposing a couple other areas that are non-interstate in the northwestern part of the states so that we have coverage, that we would be able to demonstrate that we would have charging stations at least every 50 miles along those corridors, no more than one mile off of the exit. So we're working at putting together that plan right now. Um, it'll be administered, the, the folks actually hosting those and doing those, I think will be largely, uh, largely private sector, quick trips, hotels, uh, whatever it may be. Um, and so when we submit our next federal plan, that's when we'll look at starting to expend uh, those, those electric vehicle charging monies. And then in addition to all of those monies that we know Wisconsin is getting, uh, we all, there's also a significant amount of money that's available for competitive grants. And so um, there's some that are specifically available just for locals, safe streets, uh, some other ones like that, uh, that, that we wouldn't be the entity applying for, but we are trying to make sure we're reaching out as much as we can to be as helpful as we can if, if there's uh, resources that we can provide for locals that are putting in for that. But there's, there's other uh, various grant opportunities that are out there. So we're going to do what we can, uh, both at the state level, to be as aggressive as we can applying for those funds, but also trying to provide the resources to the extent that we can for locals that are looking at uh, applying for those grants as well. So, uh, like I said, I know you've got a very full agenda tonight. I tried to cover that. Hopefully, I didn't talk too fast. Uh, but uh, we just kind of wanted to give you a brief update on where we are at the state and with the federal funding coming in. So, appreciate the opportunity very much. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Thompson. Uh, next is public addresses. All right, first we have Deidre Mele of Sheboygan talking about uh, the ARPA resolution. Hello, is that good? Okay. Hi there, I am uh, Deidre Malay. I am um, the executive director of the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. I wanna say thank you to Administrator Payne, Chairman Koch, and the County Board Supervisors for the opportunity. Uh, your willingness to inclusively seek community input and your recommendations and support of developing and implementing the ARPA task force process has been phenomenal. I had the pleasure of chairing the Workforce Development Task Force, participating on the Broadbend Task Force, and although not officially uh, participating, there was certainly partnership and support of the Affordable Housing Task Force as well. I would also like to thank all of the task force members for their willingness to step in and give of their time and talent. They met for more than five months um, and in between regular meetings, they spent a lot of time in between on research um, and additional homework, if you will. 
So really, um, their willingness to give that much time to this process was also phenomenal. Bringing these groups together not only encouraged diverse thought around the table, but it also encouraged problem solving with intention to tackle the mountains before us. I live and breathe workforce development in my professional role. I get to do it all the time. I understand the need for and importance of filling the positions in Sheboygan County, providing relief to our employers so they can operate and continue growth in our region, and removing barriers to access so that workers who are looking for an opportunity to live, work, and play in someplace better, Sheboygan County, will have those chances. Because of that, I'm very excited about the recommendations and thoughtfulness of the Workforce Development Task Force, but also excited about what the other task forces were able to accomplish as well. Child care, affordable housing, broadband, behavioral health, and transportation must all be working in unison because not one can be successful or fulfill its mission without the others. The process that we embarked on in 21 and 22 was just that, collaborative and forward thinking. And as a community with a growth mindset, great quality of life, and a significant number of opportunities available, the strength in our collaborations and the ability to leverage these resources and remove barriers to access is what sets us apart from other communities. So with that, I'd like to encourage the County Board to support the proposed resolution, and thank you again for including me in this process and for your consideration. Next is Kate Bear of Elkhart Lake regarding the ARPA resolution. Good evening. My name is Kate Bear. I have worked as an executive director in the social sector in Sheboygan County for over 18 years, most recently the last two and a half as executive director of United Way of Sheboygan County. I would like to start by taking a moment to thank the county for establishing a process that sought out community input um, and really valued inclusivity and what these experts and each of these task force brought in as experts. So um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I was co-chair with the Behavioral Health and Crisis Task Force along with Matt Stripmotter. And just like many other task forces, again, we worked really hard to find representation and in our case alone, we had 23 individuals representing 16 behavioral health related organizations right here in Sheboygan County that analyzed the major gaps identified by recent community assessments and ultimately brought forth four recommendations, two of which you see um, in this resolution. So again, it was a group effort of a lot of individuals who live and breathe this work, um, bringing in the people who benefit, right, who need it most. So I also participated in the broadband task force, um, presented to the housing task force on the challenges faced by asset limited income constrained families and individuals. Um, I sat on the workforce development task force uh, as well a little bit. And my colleague at United Way Director of Community Development, Gina Cavelli, had the opportunity to co-chair and help lead the child care task force. So yes, United Way was proudly very involved in this inclusive, exciting and creative and meaningful approach. So I wanted to quickly highlight a few recommendations included in this resolution before you all. Um, again, these recommendations invest in our community's health and safety, serving um, the most impacted by the pandemic, right? That's, that's the goal here. So mental health, substance abuse, crisis response, and barriers to accessing care continue to be of significant concern in this community, right? Violence in our community we're concerned about. Um, of violence everywhere. And, and so one of the amazing programs that we hope these ARPA dollars can help launch is the Neighborhood Social Workers Program. Um, it works within the city of Sheboygan neighborhoods with the most significant challenges that um, family, the most significant challenged families and really builds neighborhood resiliency, self-sufficiency, reduces the likelihood of residents needing intense or emergency services, ultimately a cost savings, but also ultimately an investment in humanity. Um, they help with, it, it's there. this is a model that's already happening, right, in La Crosse and Dane counties, and they can really help elevate families accessing and finding basic food, clothing, locate and stabilize housing, um, connect with local resources for parent, family concerns, behavioral health concerns, overcome barriers to transportation, employment, and childcare, 
all things we're talking about tonight. And so um, there's already been neighborhoods identified where we get a lot of CPS calls. There's a lot of children who need our help and families who need our help. And this type of program can really connect with a neighborhood and help elevate it. So I'm, I'm excited to help and hope that moves forward. Um, investing in our communities certainly continues with prevention. And one thing connected to all of this is early care and education. So hiring recruitment specialists, um, as well as inclusion specialists, via an already well-established nonprofit, Family Connections, which is our community's child care resource and referral agency, um, by providing these supports, we will maintain current early care and education, or child care professionals, in Sheboygan County, and we're going to reduce that burnout. It's really hard to work with families that are struggling and kids' behaviors, and we're not retaining child care teachers. So we can build all the child care centers we want, but not have people to work and work with our children and want to be there. Um, so we need to pay a livable wage. We need to, um, again, if we're gonna bring more families in through workforce development and through amazing housing initiatives, th there's no place for the children to go to get the quality care and we're not in an economy where even if families wanted to stay home, they often don't have that choice either, right? So we just, we really need to step up in our community and I'm really excited to looking at the innovative solutions that the Child Care Task Force came up with. Um, you all know the statistics, so I don't need to ramble on there, but they're bad, right? So I will just comment real quickly on a few. Um, as of January 20th when this was wrote, and I think we even lost a child care center since then, we had only 21 licensed group child care centers and now we have 20. Um, there are more than 357 known children on waiting lists in Sheboygan County. I also worked in early care and education for years, and the chance of abuse of our children who are in unregulated child care settings, it's overwhelming. So roughly we have 200 of those, almost 400 individuals, really, under the age of two that need child care. So, you know, toddlers, infants. Current wait list is just, uh, it's, Incredibly daunting, but I know with these proposed recommendations and with recruiting new um, child care providers uh, as well as inclusion specialists, we can really address this problem in our community. Um, all of these recommendations that will be discussed and brought forth tonight really do leverage additional resources. We all worked hard to look at that, to look at if they were equitable and who we're serving in our county. Um, and they work in collaboration across multiple agencies and sectors. So with that, um, thank you again for the opportunity. This means a lot to our entire community. We have so much to be proud of, and I encourage the county board to support the proposed resolution. So thank you for your consideration. Next is Kristen Stearns of Sheboygan regarding the ARPA resolution. like a yo-yo. Um, Adam, Chairman Kosh, County Board Supervisors, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I did not get to chair any of these amazing committees, but I did serve on three of them. But first and foremost, I want you to know um, that my name is Kristen Stearns and I'm the CEO of Lakeshore Community Healthcare. I've been there nine years now. Um, and uh, all of these uh, initiatives and task forces that have been in place affect um, what we're doing at Lakeshore. So just think about that. Every single one of them affects what I do at Lakeshore Community Healthcare. Um, and we serve over 7,000 people in Sheboygan County and 13,000 people throughout Sheboygan and Mantua counties. Secondly, what a progressive group to want to get community input of subject matter experts to really identify key areas in which dollars could impact our community in such a large way. Um, serving in multiple counties, I can tell you that this is not the process that has occurred in other places. In fact, little to no input has been asked of uh, nonprofit or other businesses within the community regarding ARPA funding coming in. So kudos to all of you. Um, for letting us take the time uh, to really dive in and look at what could, what could make a difference in Sheboygan County. With that, 
uh, I was able to serve on the Workforce Task Force, the Housing Task Force, and the Behavioral Health Task Force. Um, and I just want to say that um, I really believe that the $11.1 million that um, is being looked at tonight, um, this investment is a small investment that can perpetuate what Sheboygan County can do over the years. So, right, we're investing in a three-year process that really, I think, look at what that investment means over the long term. This is not just about the next three years. This is about the future of Sheboygan County. And uh, I'm really excited to see things like a neighborhood social work program, increased broadband access, uh, again, telehealth, telemedicine, hugely needed in our community, hugely needed for mental health. So how these connect and tie um, is just such a huge, you know, it really makes a difference. Workforce, um, as an employer of 138 individuals uh, throughout both communities, I can tell you that I actually have, uh, I have availability to hire 150 people right now, and we're struggling to hire. Um, and so workforce and, and really creating um, a pipeline to get individuals into this community is so important. And I believe that once we get people here, how can you not love this community, right? Like, it is so amazing. So we need to get people here. We need to get people engaged in our community. We need them to have access to quality childcare. We need them to have access to quality housing. Um, and, and safe and stable housing. And so again, how all of these play um, really that continuum of, of what we need in Sheboygan County to make a difference. Um, so I am not as eloquent as my two former people, but I am here to ask that you support resolution number one um, and invest in all of these amazing initiatives um, so that we can really create the best Sheboygan County as possible. Thank you. Next, we have Gary Dolmas of Sheboygan Falls regarding the ARPA resolution. Good evening. I'm Gary Dolmas, past chair and current vice chair of the SCEDC for the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. Thank you, Chairman Koch and Administrator Payne, for the honor to speak tonight to the County Board regarding the ARPA funding opportunities. The County created a task force and a funding recommendation process of which is being submitted tonight for your approval. The SCEDC formed a housing task force of over 20 participants, chaired by Don Hammond and myself. We had participants from the public, the private, the nonprofit agencies involved in housing, and a representative from the Housing Coalition. During the seven meetings that were held, we discussed all aspects and the existing financial programs available. The SCEDC knew from the beginning that housing and the development of entry level single family homes would be a colossal challenge and would require major investments from the private sector. With this challenge, we reached out to some of the county's major manufacturers and they stepped up big time. Through the SC, SCEDC and progressive thinking and generosity of Johnsonville, Kohler Company, Masters Gallery, and Sargento, the Forward Fund was created. The Forward Fund is an $8 million fund, funded 100% from the companies I just named, and was established to help spur the development of entry-level homes. The goal is to reduce the barriers to building entry-level affordable housing for those under 120% of the county medium income, the CMI. In particular, those between 80 to 120%. This is the underserved group. Our research indicated that there are many programs for those under 80% of the CMI 
but very little to serve the group that makes too much to qualify for these programs, but not enough to afford the housing that's being built or the majority of the houses on the market. The proposed $2 million in the county, fund, county funding would work in concert with the already $8 million in the forward fund. In addition, the resolution in front of you all support, also supports $500,000 towards the payment assistance program, which is so desperately needed by first-time home builders. The forward fund and the county's additional 2.5 million ARPA dollars will make a difference. I have lived here all of my life, and I'm proud to say that Sheboygan County is my home. We have made tremendous strides and have made huge differences in the lives of Sheboygan County residences. And tonight, with your approval of this funding request, we have the opportunity to do it again. I strongly request your approval of the resolution in front of you. Thank you for your wisdom and your forward thinking to make this happen. Good night. Next we have Chris Demogowski of Sheboygan regarding the ARPA resolution. Chairman Koch, Administrator Payne, and County Board members, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. If you do not know me, I am Christopher Domogalski, and I am blessed to serve as the Chief of Police in the City of Sheboygan. Over the past 12 years, I appreciate having had the experience to work collaboratively with many individuals, multi, multiple county departments, and many non-governmental organizations to provide service, solve problems, um, and help create and sustain a quality of life in Sheboygan County for most residents that is second to none. Your leadership, trust, and support of the work that we do is a key part of the many successes that we enjoy. While we enjoy a great deal of success, I think we can all agree that we have more work to do, as there are many residents of our county who still experience multiple challenges on a daily basis. I offer my thanks to you for establishing a process that sought community input and encouraged a diverse range of proposals to come forward. I appreciate the opportunity to have served on and contributed to the Behavioral Health and Crisis Response Task Force. I would like to recognize Kate Baer and Matt Strittmeiter uh, for their leadership and all the time and effort that they put into the task force. Um, I'd also like to recognize all of the other members um, that served on that task force. Um, as you can see from the speakers tonight, um, really high quality uh, members of our community um, that really are looking out for the best interests of our residents. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for all the work that they put in. And I would also like to recognize Jackie Miglowski, um for her hard work, support, and willingness to collaborate break down silos, and focusing on improving outcomes for our residents. I would ask for your support of the ARPA funds resolution. Um, in particular, I would share that um, as, as at least some degree responsible for the pandemic, um, in my work I've seen a significant increase in the um, really the amount of mental health and AODA issues that, that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, I was recently um, interviewed by the Sheboygan Press, and I would share with you the same thing that I would share with them, that we're at a point where more than 40% of our calls for service, um, so non-criminal events really, are, are in those two categories. And the amount of time that we spend responding to those incidents really prevents us from performing some of our key functions, such as traffic enforcement, and some of those things that, if I go to neighborhood meetings, are really the main concerns of our residents. And so, you know, I would ask for your support of everything in the resolution, but particularly um, my expertise would fall in that behavioral health um, area. And I would tell you that both of the programs that are in there, I believe, will lead to a more comprehensive and coordinated system that will deliver better outcomes um, to our residents. 
in particular, I believe those programs will allow us um, to establish better connections, build relationships, and get to vulnerable people before they get in crisis, um, and allow us to deliver those services that can make a difference in their life. So thank you very much. And now we have Angel Berry of Sheboygan regarding the ARPA resolution. Hello, and thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to speak. I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Angel Berry. I'm executive director of A Million Dreams. We're a new nonprofit, and we're opening a 24-7 child care center later on this fall. Um, I'm here to urge you to um, vote in favor of this resolution. There's some amazing things. It sounds like in all of them, but being on the child care task force myself, I got to see firsthand how this all developed, how it came together, and how everybody really put their passion and their heart into it. Besides that, I want to take a moment to implore you to not set this aside when we're done here today. There is a child care crisis throughout the entire country, and Sheboygan County is not missing on that boat. There are families that call every single week begging for child care. Do you know anybody who's available? I just want to go to work. So we need to make sure to keep this at the county level and keep it in front of you. And there needs to be more focus on this to come up with solutions that will help all of the families. Thank you. That's it for public addresses. And next is letters, communications, and announcements. We have none. Uh, then the county administrator's report. Hey, Mr. Chairman, good evening. I'm going to boil nine slides into two because you just heard from some incredibly eloquent speakers, and I can't recall a time during my tenure where we've had this many community leaders come forward, and I'll be pulling together to recommend and support taking action to do good things in our community. So listening to the, uh, the comments tonight was very heartwarming for me, and I trust for you as well. First, I want to, I want to thank and acknowledge Secretary Craig Thompson for joining us. Uh, that has a nice ring to it, DOT secretary. I, I've known Craig for almost 30 years. He used to work in the Wisconsin Counties Association, and I can't tell you how lucky we are as a state to have him as the secretary of the DOT. Thoughtful, collaborative, and gets things done. We are so fortunate. And as you all know, one of the first things that Secretary Thompson set his eyes on were completing the Highway 23 project. And we broke, uh, we broke ground, what's it been now, about three years or so. I lose track of time with everything going on, but I'm sure we're going to be having one heck of a nice uh, party this fall and, and, and celebrate success a little bit. But Secretary Thompson and his administration stepped up and delivered, and we thank you for that. So thank you for being here this evening. I also want to thank and acknowledge our affordable housing and our behavioral health and crisis response, broadband development, child care, transportation, and workforce development task force chairs. When we put this process into play uh, last fall, I think it was August 17th, um, we reached out to some community leaders, many of which you just heard from, and everyone stepped forward so remarkable about Sheboygan County is people step forward and they get engaged and they want to be helpful and we get things done. We problem solve. And uh, Don Hammond, Gary Dalmas, both co-chairing the affordable housing, Kate Bear and Matt Strittmatter, both co-chairing the behavioral health and crisis response, Chris Lewinsky, our IT director, uh, chairing the broadband development, Colleen Steinbrecher and Gina Covelli, co-chairing child care, Derek Mink, Chaired Transportation, and Dietra Martinez, I got to get used to this new uh, married name now, uh, chairing the Workforce Development Group. And as they all spoke to, people were willing and able and enthusiastic about participating. Over 100 people stepped forward to participate. 65 organizations participated. How do you not take pride in living in a community where you have that kind of engagement and leadership and community support? 
I want to thank and acknowledge Kurt Brower and Henry Nelson who participated, Vern Koch, Bill Gehring, Rebecca Clark, Ed Prochek, and also former Supervisor Charlotte Nanick and Robert Ziegelbauer who's here this evening. All of these board members also volunteered to participate on these task forces. But as was summed up this evening, uh, the collaboration was just incredible. Key organizations, Sargento Foods, Werner Homes, Sheboygan County Housing, uh, Random Lake, the SEEDC that was mentioned, Lakeshore Community Healthcare Center, United Way, Aurora Medical Center, Health and Human Services, St. Nicholas Hospital, Sheboygan Area School District, Mental Health America, Rogers Behavioral Health, uh, Plymouth School District, Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, Family Connections, Master Gallery. It goes on and on. Folks stepped up. So I personally am proud to be your county administrator and proud to live in a community where we have this kind of engagement and people who care this much about our community. And it's also heartwarming to hear the feedback from people who have some feel for how other counties are operating. Uh, Supervisor Tom Wager, as you know, serves on the WCA Board of Directors and he shared, I think, at the leadership forum and at our executive committee meeting that he isn't aware of another county that has engaged the community to the extent we have. Maybe it's happened, but I'm sure proud of what we're doing here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership and really making a difference in this community. The last thing, the last slide I'll touch on, and as you can see, I'm not even pulling it up. So nine slides to two. Uh, the process, it was back in August of 2021 that we convened these task forces. The executive committee really did the heavy lifting, so I want to thank Chairman Koch and all the members of the executive committee that were engaged. They reviewed and ranked, scored all of these recommendations. They heard presentations in this very chambers from many of the people that are here this evening. They sought more input. They ultimately unanimously proposed the resolution that is before you, and it was unanimously supported by the Finance Committee. So this is a historic county board meeting. These federal ARPA funds, I mean, it hasn't happened before. It may not happen again. And you do hear from time to time that there might be communities or bad actors who aren't sure how they're going to use it or haven't done anything yet or are doing it, everything behind closed doors. I don't know. But that's not how we roll here. That's not how we operate here. So thank you. Thank you all involved for your leadership and thank you for your consideration this evening. Okay, next is consideration of committee reports, executive committee. Resolution number two regarding authorizing sale of county property to Elkhart Lakes Road America Inc. Recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move for approval of resolution number two. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Gearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Gearing. Under discussion? Seeing no discussion, please vote. That resolution is approved unanimously. Okay, committee report. Regarding the 2021-2022 per diem report, recommendations concur. Um, we'll need a motion for this. Supervisor Brower. I make a motion to support. Thank you, Supervisor Brower. Supervisor Clark. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Clark. Under discussion? Okay, seeing no discussion, please vote. It's approved unanimously. Next is consideration of committee reports, finance committee. Resolution number one regarding improving use of American Res Rescue Plan Act funds number four, recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move for approval of resolution number one. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Testrodi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Testrodi. Under discussion. Supervisor Speltz. 
Hi, um, um, Mr. Chairman, can I speak? Okay. I um, just wanted to um, share some of my thoughts in regards to the ARPA funds. And first and foremost, I, I wanted to thank all the people that did do a lot of work. And this is my comments are in no disrespect for any of that. I just have different thoughts and opinions on it. So I just wanted to share that. Um, um, first of all, I, I just I wasn't in favor of the community shutting down in the first place, um, as far as businesses and churches and things like that, and people being you know forced to go through COVID mitigation measures. I, I believe that this was an infringement on our um, constitutional freedoms, and I also believe that people are more than capable of making their own decisions in regards to health and safety. Um, and any with any free monies, I believe there's a lot of. Um, strings attached, you know, so that's a concern. Um, and I, I, I'm I, not in favor of, the, I, I believe this is rather irresponsible in regards to the federal government to unload so much money. I believe that has a lot to do with inflation. Um, and um, I'm, not, I'm not so convinced. I mean, I was, I am very well aware of the situations of mental health concerns in the county. Um, I was a school social worker for years. I've done this kind of work for about 30, so I'm well aware of that. So I, I do understand the concerns. I'm just not convinced that, um, you know, government programs is always the answer. Um, and I know this um, probably comes in opposition of, of much of what's said. And again, I, it, this is no disrespect for, you know, the people that came forward and all the work, work that people had done, but I just needed to express my thoughts and my opinions. So thank you. Supervisor Smith. Thank you, Chairman Koch. Um, I don't know if I can have like a question answered, um, but my, my thought kind of goes to, I mean, I'm sure the intent is to have a lot of these programs continue beyond 2024. And I'm just wondering how, when the ARPA funds are exhausted, how do some of these programs stay funded? How do they keep operating? Uh, what, what, is there a plan in place to kind of continue on from this initial uh, you know, three-year three window? And I'm not sure how to, uh, you know. Each one of the uh, programs actually has in it how it would continue funding going forward. So now I'm on slide number three, the last slide of the nine. So. The, the recommendation this evening is to support buckets, and the resolution you have obviously shows whether it's for the full three years or a portion thereof. It was a little different based on the different task force recommendations, but the executive committee then, working with staff, will develop agreements with organizations that can implement these recommendations. So we have clear expectations, goals, accountability, all of reporting requirements, all of those details will have to be worked out. But as I trust everyone's aware, because all of this has been on our website for months, all of the recommendations talk about defined time periods. The ARPA funds need to be obligated by December 2024 and expended by December 2026. So in some instances, this may be a program or initiative that, you know, the ARPA funds are going to continue on. So will there be a change in scope at that time? It's possible. But what I'm hopeful for is that we will continue to see dollars leveraged and more opportunities to raise and lift expectations. And for example, childcare. If we can get more people trained and in the field of childcare, and we have good organizations for them to work in, I'd like to think that once they're employed, they're going to stay in that field. And if more people are able to take their children for childcare purposes, more are going to be able to pay for that. But you got to have some teachers there first. Uh, the work that our social workers are going to do, or working with the city of uh, police, I would like. I, I hope that we're going to see some real impactful changes there, and it's going to be so beneficial to our community that policymakers such as yourself and the city of Sheboygan are going to determine that we may have to reallocate other resources there because that is making such an impact in people's lives. So. That's what's really unique about these ARPA funds. So often you receive a grant from the state or federal level and it's a one year grant. Here we have three to four years to implement and make a profound impact in our community. And time will tell what kind of impact that is. But we've now heard from so many thoughtful leaders in the community. 
I mean, including companies like the Kohler Company and Bemis and Johnsonville and Sargento. Uh, they didn't get involved with these processes and recommend these initiatives if they didn't feel it was the right thing to do. So I hope that's helpful. Supervisor Nunhoff. Uh, hi, I'll do try to do justice. Um, I was familiar with this somewhat, but in the last 48 hours, I spent at least an hour looking at what this uh, plan act actually is on the website. And my interpretation of what I read is that it was a COVID driven act by our legislation in Washington, DC. It's all over the place, COVID many, many times mentioned in it, and it was that, about that. And that on the short tails of that, I was, I was surprised at the length of what this was. I guess maybe not surprised, but many things that it mentioned that are health related that would be on the short tails of COVID. Uh, I'm surprised because of that tonight, I didn't hear from the speakers, and I'm not being critical, but I didn't hear anyone mention COVID, the word. I heard a few things about nursing, well, facilities, child care workers. That was what I read today in the actual act that I read, those words. Child, child care programs, public health. But there were some things that I heard that really didn't pertain to what I read about today. So I'm not being difficult about this. If anyone in this room or anyone listening, wherever you are, thinks I don't care about our society, that is not true. I've been a mentor in our jail for inmates for 12 years minimum. These are the most distraught people in our society. And that's not what this subject is about, but I, want, I don't want people to misinterpret uh, what I'm saying and how I vote on this, because I do care for people. Uh, I was on the Sheboygan uh, excuse me, Kohler School Board, now I'm on the county board. I tell people, and this is legitimate, I don't do this for me. I do it for our society and our families and our children and grandchildren. So this is the first time our federal government ever spent $1.9 trillion on anything like this, and that was mentioned tonight by someone. Uh, but the amount wasn't. But this is the first time this was ever. And this money is not free money. I know it's wonderful to get free money. I like to personally get free money. But it's not free. This $1.9 trillion, we don't have that. That was given to us. Yeah, it's nice. I agree it's nice. But we don't have that. That was added to our deficit. And this isn't billions of dollars. This is 1.9 trillion. And now this is like, the, I think probably the last wave, three or four waves of money that have been issued by our federal government to us and it trickles down to us. And this is wonderful. I'm not debating anything and all the goodnesses of what we've done with this money. My issue is that this will affect us, everyone in this room eventually. This money is not free. It's nice. I'm not debating anything and all the wonderfulness. And I, I already said what I care about personally in our society, and I'm passionate about that. I just don't care. I'm passionate about it. So this is the fourth wave of federal money, and I struggle with this because it is wonderful to get money, but it was all about COVID. When I read this, it was about COVID. So I don't connect the dots here. And I'll conclude with that. I, I just don't connect the dots with some of the things. Some of the things I heard tonight are wonderful. Hey, I'm passionate. Again, I, I go into jail every week to talk to most distraught people. I care about people, and I surely care about our kids. I preface tonight by saying I care about our families and our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, please vote. Yeah, 
motion is approved, 22 ayes and three nays. And with that, I will hand the gavel over to the vice chair. Uh, resolutions to be introduced. Uh, first will be resolution number three from law committee. Regarding authorizing director of emergency management to enter into mutual aid agreement with other emergency management officers. That be related to the executive committee, please. Ordinance is introduced. We have none. Okay, well thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I moved to adjourn. Supervisor Brower. Thank you. Let all vote then. Supervisor Ryman.